Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to this magnificent occasion of an, our, the next in our series of the Articulation Series. Um, each week we highlight the art of a different artist and the sermon of a different rabbi across North America and the world. And, uh, and we, they, they've each gone through a process of studying Torah together elevating each other in, in creative ways and pushing boundaries and in, in thinking about the texts very differently. Today we have the honor of present, having presented before us Gabriela Boros. Gabriela uh, is a painter, a drawer, a sculptist, and uh, has uh, been exhibited nationally and internationally Right now, she's focusing on uh, the medium of woodblock prints and uh, al always converges the worlds of Judaism in her art and uh, botany and folklore. It's very, very uh, privileged to have uh, Gabriella. We also have Rabbi Benjamin Greenfield. Rabbi Green Greenfield is uh, the rabbi at the Greenpoint Shul in Brooklyn. Very tricky there. Green field, green point. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of colors to, <laughs> to expose. Um, and uh, uh, we trained at Yeshivat Haaretzion, Yeshiva University, Oxford, John Hopkins, and Yeshivat Chovavei Torah. Um, we have uh, a wonderful evening. But before we get into the art, Rabbi, would you please frame the portion? to get us started. Sure, excellent. So I'm gonna give you some words of introduction to the portion, to the part to the part of the Parsha, the, the verses that uh, inspired myself and Gabriella, and maybe just even a little, a sense of the, I think the emotion and the, the tension in the text, which it seems to me and Gabriella could confirm or deny, uh, the emotion and the tension in the text, which I think ultimately spoke to Gabriella and led her to, to create uh, the beautiful piece that she created. So this week's Parsha, it's uh, Yitro, and there's a lot in it. Revelation at Sinai, the Ten Commandments. So many juicy pieces that uh, an artist and a rabbi could have uh, dove into. And I think it's awesome that we actually focused on um, the opening narrative, the, the namesake of the Parsha, which often is, is overlooked, the Yitro part of the Parsha. Uh, and the basic story, I'll just say it here. The basic story is that Moshe's father-in-law, Yitro, out in Midian, he hears that Moshe has successfully rescued the people from Egypt, Brought them, out of the, brought them out of Egypt and out of slavery, that God has redeemed God's people. And he comes and he greets Moshe in the desert and brings actually Moshe's family, his wife and his two kids along. And it's this celebratory scene. Yitro is like amazed. Wow, Hashem saved the Jewish people. He brings sacrifices. There's, a, a, there's food, of course. They sit down, they enjoy a meal together. It's like a lovely celebratory scene. It's kind of a nice coda to the whole Exodus narrative. We've made it home in a sense. Um, and then the next morning, Yitro gets up and, you know, here, here I am, I'm with the redeemed Jews in the desert. They finally made it out of Egypt. He gets up and what he sees deeply disturbs, disturbs him. Like this, for this, you freed yourselves from Egypt. So what is it that he sees? Um, he sees Moshe seated by himself uh, to provide judgment and counsel. And he sees a huge crowd of Israelites standing before Moshe, waiting their turn in line uh, from, the Torah says, from morning until night. They're just standing there waiting to get their turn to approach Moshe. Uh, and so the language of the, of the Torah is, uh, Moshe kosher hu when Moshe's father-in-law Yitro sees what Moshe is doing to the people, making them wait there, making them approach just himself, just this one figure of Torah, one figure of judgment. But Yomari says, what are you doing to the people? Why are you sitting alone? With all the people standing about you from morning until night. Now, Moshe does respond. Moshe says, well, look, they're inquiring of Hashem. They're seeking judgment. They're seeking counsel. They're seeking knowledge of, of God's Torah and God's laws. And to this, Yitro responds. and says, Moshe, love. Moshe, uh, Yitro responds to Moshe and says, okay, I, look, I get it. There's a need here. There's a Torah need. There's a judgment need. There's a counsel need. But lo tov. It's not good. This is bad. This is a bad system. And Yitro continues explaining why it's bad. Navol tibol, 
you will surely wear yourself out. Navol tibol, you'll get, you'll, I, I said wear out, actually, I want to say wither, that's a better translation. You will wither out, you'll wear down, you'll, um, yeah, you'll wither away. Gamata, you're going to wither away. Gamamaze, and also this people, the nation, they're going to wither away. Asherimach, this people with you. Ki mincha, this is too heavy for you. This is too weighty. This is too much of a weight on your back and your shoulders. Lo tuchal asohu livadecha. You are not able to do this alone. Uh, those are Yitro's very powerful words to Moshe. I get that there's a need. I get that people need guidance and law and rule and Torah, but it's not, you can't do it alone. You shouldn't be doing it alone. Uh, the story wraps up with Yitro suggesting, advising that, that Moshe set up, a, if we want to say it negatively, a kind of bureaucracy of Torah teachers like a whole sort of hierarchy of judges that you can go to. If you have a smaller case, you go here, a more complicated case, you go there. Um, I think a more positive phrase would be something like a support system for Moshe or a support system for a, a collaborative form of Torah study that is not just Moshe, but it's a whole uh, system and hierarchy and support and, and uh, um, collaborative structure of, of judgment and justice uh, being meted out. Um, now, in a way, it's kind of like a simple story or a logistical story. Yitro sees an issue, tells Moshe about it, and Moshe hears it and changes it. Okay? Like, uh, but there is some tension in the scene, and I think the tension and the emotion um, comes out in two ways. And my guess is that it's that those moments of tension, which I think spoke to Gabriella. So I'll, I'll highlight those moments of tension or the moments where the emotion comes out. And one, and one is that the, the Torah chooses to give us a dialogue, a back and forth between Moshe and Yitro. And in that back and forth, I, I think it, it gives us a little bit of empathy and humanity to Moshe's position. Like I'm in this important role, like I've got to do this, but I also, I imagine the camera sort of turning both sides. We get to play the role of Yitro, visitor, newbie, observing what's happening. And we also get to play the role of Moshe who's in it, in it in a way that he's maybe blind to the problem, but also in a way that nobody in the world understands the problem better than he. So I think that that dialogue has an important poetic and emotional um, effect uh, on us and turns it from a, a logistical, like there was a problem and they solved it and into really a story. Um, and the other piece that I think uh, interests a lot of Meforshim, a lot of commentators in a way that the text provides more than just a logistical account, but a real color uh, is sort of parsing out Yitro's various claims about the problem of this system. Some of his language is quite evocative. So, uh, to, so some, some of that language is that navoltivol, that you're withering away. What does Yitro mean by that? And it's, it's really very poetic and evocative language that, that I'm sure Gabriella, or if not a Gabriella later, I will talk about. And also, ki chaved mim chahadavar, this is too heavy. This is too heavy. Um, as, a side, as a side note, back when the, uh, the Egyptians were trying to cross the split sea, trying to chase after Jewish people, one of the key words, the key shorashim there is, is chaf bet dalet, heavy, or even honor, kavod, gravity. Uh, their wheels get stuck. The chariots become too heavy. It's actually a very big uh, theme word. And here, just like the wheels got stuck for the Egyptians, they couldn't escape the sea, the waters covered them over. Moshe, you're going to get stuck in this. You're going to get mired in this. Um, and so I think there's a lot of commentary interest in what exactly was that claim and also midrashic interest. Why that, um, why that mashal, why that metaphor of heaviness? Um, so with those two sort of elements that add some color to this story, the dialogue, the focus, the, the switch of Yitra's perspective and Moshe's perspective, and also um, those questions of what does it mean to be withering? What does it mean to have something too heavy? Why those specific poetic words? Uh, I will back away and uh, I'll give the floor to Gabriella. Thank you, Rabbi. I think that um, one of the things that really draws me in life is narrative. And that immediately, that dialogue, that relationship between Yitro and Moshe was an immediate pull for me because um, Yitro is actually a priest. He is comes from, he's not a Jewish priest. Um, and so uh, obviously Moshe married the daughter of a priest, he married somebody with, you know, she, she was very, um, she came from a very good background. And um, uh, yet he's not a Jew. Um, so 
for Moshe to heed, to listen, to take the word of somebody that is from completely outside of this relationship, this strong relationship, the bond that he has with God is remarkable because I think that um, so few people are able to hear advice and even fewer are able to act on that advice. So for me, right away, that, that dynamic and that story already pulled me in. And as somebody who's very much an, interested in botany, the, the imagery of Navol Tibor, this withering, this withering tree, absolutely was the perfect metaphor for how Moses was faring in, in this new life um, in the desert. Um, so the top print is um, from Yitro's viewpoint. And I've depicted Yitro with darker skin than Moshe because Yitro was of the desert. He was a, a peoples of the desert. And I feel that those people always have darker skin because they're under the sun so much. And I wanted to have that a dynamic between the two of them, the difference, show the difference between them. And again, it's very hard to take advice from somebody that's different than you. And the fact that Moshe had the wisdom and the, and the, the uh, openness to take this on, in my opinion, just makes Moshe that much more of a mensch and that much more of a wise, wise you know, as we call Moshe Rabbeinu. Um, so here you see um, Yitro looking on very sadly at Moshe. And Moshe is leaning against his knee. He's tired. There are scads of people pushing and shoving and yelling and everybody wants to get in the front of the line. They've been waiting there for a really long time. And Moshe is physically tired. He's mentally tired. It's hard, it's hot. Um, and right next to Moshe is that very embodiment of the Navol Tibol, that tree that's withered, that's leaning, that's struggling to remain alive despite the odds. And of course, because they're almost at Sinai, they are in desert conditions. And so very few trees can survive in those conditions. And right behind also right there where uh, Dvil is uh, showing is the smoke that's uh, kind of leading the people to keeping them together. And behind the smoke are those very difficult mountains that Moshe will have to ascend in order to bring down the Torah. So it's kind of a foreshadowing of what's to come. Um, and, and the legions of people all around in the camps, um, they're, they're living in tents. It's, it's, it's a very difficult struggle that they all have. And because they're living one on top of the other, of course, there's going to be all these cases that Moshe needs to figure out and adjudicate. Um, so that's setting up that's setting up that first uh, scene from Yito's standpoint. And when we look down at the next um, print, um, I drew this uh, image from a mechilta. And Dvir, what, what is the mechilta by who? Rabbi Ishmael. Yes, thank you, Rabbi. Um, and um, Again, it was referencing a tree and it referenced that a tree that is moist with water cannot be lifted by three, but must be lifted by five. It's too heavy for three. And so this idea that, uh, again, it's, it's, a, it's a botanic reference. It's a reference to trees. It just beautifully wrapped up for me this idea that Moshe really understands the gravity of the situation and acts on that gravity. So this is from Moshe's standpoint. He's envisioning how these men are going to carry on this tree and take it off as if off of his own shoulders. 
we have Yitro in the background kind of going, oh, wow, he's taking my advice. And behind Yitro, we have the burning bush. And the burning bush references the first time that Moshe and Yitro had an interaction right after Moshe had the experience of the burning bush. So once again, I'm using the botanics in order to reference um, different aspects of Moshe's life. And um, so this is so this is what it is. I wanted to also point out that the dress that they're wearing, the way that their their features don't I don't believe in these, you know, kind of I don't know, typical way of, of how to think of Moshe. For me, he's very um, very modern thinker. So I've trimmed his beard. I've given him kind of a more contemporary look because I want that feeling of being able to relate to Moshe, to relate to Moshe's struggle and to see the people as contemporaries, as they, they had the same struggles as we have today. And so to me, it's always important to contemporize um, the parashot and make them, parashiot, to make them look like it could happen today. Excellent. Thank you, thank you. Um, Rabbi, would you like to, uh, to react and kind of bring some Torah that, that this elicited in you? Sure. Okay. So I want to share um, the, the Torah that came to my mind, ideas that came to my mind in being inspired by and analyzing uh, this piece of, of art. Um, so I think the theme that stands out to me most is um, the mount, the way that the mountains in these images, uh, they, these are not soft, round, inviting mountains. These are intense, difficult, craggy mountains. I look at them and like, I, I would not want to journey there. Uh, and my mind goes to this image of the mountain as a symbol for revelation and a symbol for Torah. And the people too in this image, particularly on, on the top, uh, the, the, the sort of huge mass of, in this case, sort of faceless individuals, they, to me, kind of blur into that, those mountains and they, are part, they become for Moshe part of the weight of Torah. And I think this idea that, the, the, that Torah can be experienced as too heavy and as rocky and as dangerous uh, isn't new. Certainly the, the Midrashic idea that appears in the Talmud of God holding Sinai over the Jewish people and threatening them they must receive the Torah is I think probably the most powerful image of the Torah as a weighty rock that actually can hurt us. Um, but it makes me think of the way that Moshe actually has a very complicated relationship to rock and stone throughout his career. Um, so we have, you know, the narratives of Moshe talking to the rock and the narrative of Moshe hitting the rock. We have the narrative of Moshe carving a tablet, uh, the carving the tablets out of rock, uh, the second set of the Ten Commandments. And uh, sort of in contrast to that, the image of Moshe smashing the tablets, the first tablets that he received from God. So Moshe has this whole sort of back and forth with rock and with stone, which I think to some extent reflects Moshe's back and forth with the weight of Torah and the weight of Torah responsibility. Um, and don't get me wrong, Torah, much like mountains, could have been presented in a more inviting way, uh, a beautiful panorama, uh, a beautiful uh, place which to journey. But I think in this scene, that's definitely not how Moshe experiences it. And Yitro sees that. Yitro sees that uh, that Torah in this moment is becoming actually just a weight and a burden. Um, and I love in, in this piece of art, the contrast between the sort of soulless, soulless, harsh, exhausting rock and exhausting mountains with the soft and perishable and tender biological matter, the, the tender tree. Um, uh, and, you know, in, in Moshe is looking at these people and they're kind of merging into the stone, they're merging into this, into this uh, burden upon him. But particularly in this first image where Moshe is kind of, the, the, in my mind, sort of the focus, even Yitro is looking at Moshe. Um, Moshe is a tree, Moshe is tender and Moshe is vulnerable. Uh, and we, I think, generally, we prefer the terminology of the Eitz Chaim. We would like to think of the Torah as a tree of life, not as a stone. A stone can't have life. Stones are soulless in a way. A tree of life. And under these conditions, the tree is withering. Um, and I think, uh, 
you know, I think that when Moshe imagines himself receiving the Torah, or perhaps this scene is a little bit after he received the Torah, I think Moshe thinks if I'm going to see, receive the Torah, which is carved into stone, and which I'm going to accept there on a peak of stone, then maybe I've got to be like stone. And I will stand here just myself and the people will come and I will never wear out. I'll never wear out just me and I'm enough and I can do it. I'm going to be as strong as the Torah itself. I'm going to be as strong as the material, the physical, tangible material uh, that the Torah, the Ten Commandments are themselves inscribed upon. Uh, and, you know, I'd like to sort of imagine in that first top image, Yitro looking at Moshe, Moshe himself um, in this top image, positioning Moshe's own body like a mountain. You can see the sort of peak of his shoulder and the peak of his scalp, positioning himself as a mountain, but Yitro sees past that. You, you are no mountain. You are, but, uh, you are but flesh and bud. You are but dust that will return to dust. You climbed up the mountains to receive the Torah, but at heart you're a tree, and I see uh, that you're fading. Um, I, think, I think there's a, a nice little meta point here, which is that the, the language of the psukim, Navol Tibol, uh, which, which Gabriel really was inspired by, which has a, which Rashi points out has a deep biological meaning. When you look for that root, that shoresh in Nach, in the words of the prophets, um, Navo, uh, that, that shoresh comes up off, almost always uh, in the context of biological matter fading, of grapes fading, of leaves fading, of trees fading and withering away. Um, I think that there's this beautiful kind of meta moment where the, the verses are pointing to a kind of tree, a withering, a fading tree. Um, the midrash with Gabriella plays with below, uh, this midrash about weight and heaviness that Yitro's like, you know, have you seen people carrying wood? Have you seen people carrying wood? One or two people can't do it by themselves. You need four or five to carry a moist, heavy, freshly cut piece of wood. That also brings in the, the biologicalness, the mortality, the humanness, the tenderness that's in this setting that otherwise would, would be surrounded by rocks, by sand, by desert, by mountain. Um, and uh, of course, the grand irony or meta-ness here is that if I'm correct or wrong, but this, this medium is woodcut uh, to this story that was, you know, in some sense inscribed on the tablets, uh, we have a, a piece made out of wood. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a nice tie-in, uh, uh, the, the wood of the, of the narrative that's, in, that's put in by the poetry, the words, and by the midrash, uh, and the wood of the medium itself. Um, Oh gosh, I could say more, but that was just a monologue. I don't know if Gabrielle, if you want to jump in and add something, respond to that. Yeah, I, I did want to I did want to um, say a couple of things. Um, for me, I had interpreted that um, actually um, this was kind of um, before Moses got the tablets, and that mm -hmm. Yitlo, in a way, by telling Moses, you need to rest, he was setting up Moses to have the mental and the physical space to be able to climb the mountain and face the hardships, 40 days and 40 nights of, of smoke and fire and, 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 and worship with God as the tablets were being created. I mean, he had so much to withstand and he wouldn't have had that ability had Yitro not given him this space before he had he made that ascent and bringing them down um, was also can you imagine how heavy they must have been so physically he needed the rest mentally he needed to have that space emotionally and and psychologically available and how can you do that when there are people constantly you know asking you questions and 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 kind of pulling at your heartstrings it's impossible so Yitro really enabled, in my opinion, he enabled these tablets to be to be given to the Jews. It was kind of Yitro was this intermediary that made it all possible. So I really did. I did, I do want to say that 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 I felt that Yitro was like a major major player here in 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 this in this narrative. Um, um, if I. Yeah, it, yes. if, I, if I could zoom us out for a, a second, just provide some context. It's, a, it's a, probably the most important interpretive debate about this passage is whether it occurs before 
Sinai before the giving of the Torah and the Ten Commandments or whether it occurs afterwards. In the order of the Torah, it's certainly before. It's only later in the Parsha that the Torah will be, uh, that revelation will occur. So this chronologically sure sounds like it's happening before the Torah is given. But on the other hand, uh, the people are lining up to receive guidance and wisdom and teaching which wisdom, which teaching. In fact, Moshe's language is, I'm providing Torah for them. So what Torah is he providing? So that leads some commentaries to suggest that really here the Torah is written out of order and this whole scene happened after Sinai. But as Gabrielle mentioned, there's a lot of reason to, there's a lot of reason, a lot of beauty in actually reading this as a prelude to the giving of the Torah. And maybe something in this moment and this scene is necessary so that later Moshe can receive the Torah. Um, and I think um, I noticed somebody had asked me about this and, and Rabbi you as, as well had said that, you know, here you are, um, you know, uh, creating a wood block print, a wood cut out of wood um, and how appropriate that is because the whole idea we're talking about is is obviously as wood and 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 so yeah so my media like, how, how much wood could a wood cut cut <laughs> <laughs> a lot <laughs> um, I've chosen uh, I started doing the wood blocks um, about 10 years ago and um, it is something for me it is the most um, uh, it, it's a fervor. I, I just, it really is a very passionate way for me to express my art and my work. And um, I think because this, there's such an intimacy that you have with the wood that you're, you're cutting it. It's, it's such a meditative process. Um, I've become more and more interested in, in, in botany, in trees, in, in, in the entire botanical world. And a lot of my work also deals with that. And so for us to have this parasha, it's a Shemitah year, um, the, you know, the, a year of rest where we are really trying to let the land rest. I mean, this really was the most perfect, beautiful storm with a wonderful, wonderful teacher who was able to kind of lead me right to this, this print. I mean, I think that the, the chemistry of the two of us just was so easy. It was so easy to hear your voice and to incorporate your words into this artwork. It was really amazing. I, I've, I've worked with other people and it's, it was really a, a wonderful, it was kismet. Yay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, um. Thank you. I may word to say for you as well. I want to hold the baby uh, to the end uh, about this process, which was awesome for me. Um, I want to, I see somebody points out, Ronnie uh, kind of kind of point this out, and I was wondering a lot about it as well. Um, the contrast between this tree, which again is not in the verses themselves, just alluded to that Yitro calls, says Moshe, you're withering, you're fading, and uses language that one would use for a tree. Um, that tree that's evoked uh, in the verses and other trees in Moshe's life and other trees in the Torah. So it's a great contrast, of course, to the burning bush. Uh, the burning bush, the whole point is that it should be consumed. It should be withering. But God provides Moshe this image of a bush that, although it should be withering away, it's not. Um, although you wouldn't expect it to survive, somehow it does. Of course, this becomes a powerful symbol for the Jewish people itself. Um, so it is kind of striking then to see Yitro say, oh, yeah, that's the Jewish people, Moshe. You, however, you very much are fading. Uh, it's a, a really interesting contrast. And what I wrote about uh, in my uh, drusher for this week is I do believe that this story uh, and Yitro's words intentionally, intentionally um, invoke and evoke another important tree. Uh, in the Torah, and that is the tree in the Garden of Eden, or the first tree in the Garden of Eden, um, the Eitz Dat Tov uh, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, as I write about um, Yitro's words of lo tov, this is not good, this is really not good, has only one other uh, parallel in all of, in all of Chumash, in, in the five books of Moshe. We only see that phrase, and they're two pretty common words, lo, no, and tov, good, so not good. Uh, only appears twice here in, in Yitro's words to Moshe. This is a bad idea. This is not a good system. And God reflecting on the creation of a lonely Adam, a lonely human. God says, Lotov, uh, Hayot Adam Levado. 
It's not good for the human to be alone. And I think it's really striking that both low tobes, the Yitro low tobe to Moshe about this system, and the God low tobe um, to about the human um, are both about isolation and loneliness. And they both include the Hebrew, the Hebrew root levad alone. Um, Yitro says, you can't do all this alone, alevadecha. And God says, this is not good that this human thing is all alone. Um, so I think it's it's a uh, Yitro's words here. I think are meant to to create a parallel there. And if we do see in Yitro's words also a reference to the tree, I think it ties us in even more uh, tightly with the tree, with the Garden of Eden scene and the creation of Adam and Eve. Um, there we have another parallel of there is this sort of source of wisdom. It's a pre-Torah source of wisdom, much like in Gabrielle's reading. This is pre-Sinai, so we don't have a a written Torah yet. The 613 mitzvahs have yet to be uh, commanded, maybe a couple of them, but the vast majority not yet. Um, so there is this divine wisdom that exists in the ether, in tree form, in Moshe's mind maybe, um, and it needs to be accessed. And in both cases, there is a concern about um, about accessing it all alone. Um, now, I, I don't want to claim that uh, I don't want to claim necessarily that the that the humans eating of the tree was necessarily a good thing. But I can say it only happens once there's two humans, um, and it's once there's two that the access to the information and, and the effect of that information on humanity can occur. And Yitro here is, I think, in a similar position. He sees that there's a sort of pre-Sinaitic wisdom or Torah out there, but it's being embodied by and attempted to be accessed by one person. And Yitro says, I've, I've seen this scene before. I've been in the garden before, and that's not how it's supposed to be. Loto, this is not good. You're all alone. So uh, I, I don't know exactly what to make of this parallel, but it's very clear to me that there is some kind of Edenic parallel brought out here. The low toe of Yitro, it's only corollary is the low toe of the Garden of Eden. And in both cases, the concern is about somebody being alone. Yeah. And, how, and how today in our Zoom filled world, we all sit in our front of our screens and we're alone because we have this crazy pandemic. And so again, there's this parallel with this pasha of, you know, thank goodness we have the Zoom because thank goodness we have this community that we can create. I'm here in Chicago, you're in Brooklyn. Um, it was, it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing that um, this togetherness that we can have and, um, we can we can learn from this too, right? That uh, Zelotov. I mean, it's, we do not want to be alone. We don't want to be, um, uh, uh, you know, alienated from the from from the others by being the one wise guy, the only guy that knows the answers. That's that's not really the Jewish way, anyway, right? Um, we always have a panel of people that we can turn to. I think this, there's, this, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thought. Yes. And uh, I'll say there, there is an irony in Yitro's role here in regard to should authority come from one person? Should learning come from one person? I think that irony to me is reflected in how you created this piece. Um, because I, I see in, in both images Yitro a little bit as a singular source of authority. Maybe I'm, I'm, to uh, incline towards some tropes here, but the long beard, the stern look, he stands set apart. He comes in, he's the outside consultant. You know, McKinsey sent him and he's gonna tell us how our camp should operate. Um, and he, he does have that, but, but as it turns out, when he opens his mouth as this sort of singular oracle, this uh, singular entity and authority that has the wisdom, his wisdom is all about, um, dividing up wisdom. His wisdom is all about the wisdom of the masses or about creating a hierarchy, uh, a bureaucracy, a support system, a collaborative process. And that I think even comes out in the drawing. So he on the one hand is presented sort of on the side, alone, stern, on high authoritative, but what he's learning from in the below panel, the mashal he points to uh, is look at all these people and how a people as a group interact. You can learn something from them. Do you see how one or two can't carry it, but four or five together can? The wisdom he brings is all about the wisdom of look, look from, look from, and learn from. Look at and learn from groups, uh, and I think we see that also up above. His singular wisdom is all about. There's this mass of people in front of you. You should be supporting them, learning from them, and not positioning yourself as an oracle. So I, I like how that tension plays out. I think as well in the art. 
yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> shoot, I have one more. I've got one more rant left, easy. Go ahead, <laughs> go ahead, take it away. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so uh, then maybe, I'll, maybe we'll, I'll pass it off and maybe we'll take some questions. Um, I, I do want to, um, I, I, I do want to highlight that I think there's uh, a nice little pun in Yitro's name here, uh, and also in Moshe's name, and in the roles they play in this story. So the etymology, the origin of Moshe, Moshe's name is that he's drawn. He was drawn up from the water. Uh, I, his uh, foster mother says, I drew him out of the water. And I think certainly in English, and a little bit in the Hebrew, the connotation is there as well. That's Moshe's feeling in, this, in these scenes. He's drawn. He's overdrawn. Uh, there is a limited source from which to pull, and he has been pulling out from it. He is drawn. Um, he's mashui, in a sense. Um, and Yitro, his name being related to Yoter, to more, additional, extra, the advice he brings, Yitro comes and says, don't do it alone, don't be one, be Yoter. I want a whole system here. There should be 70 of you guys here. There should be a whole system. So I think it's, I think the Torah is being a little maybe cheeky in this scene of setting up the drawn figure and the like, let's add more figure and us seeing the dialogue between them and ultimately Yitro really winning out. And we choose a system that's, ba that's based on Yetzer and not based on, on being overdrawn. Yeah. And uh, shoot. <laughs> and that name, certainly in the English connotation of drawn and overdrawn really does it really does accurately describe Moshe's feeling throughout the 40 years. The whole, the whole drama, the whole tragedy, the whole emotion of Moshe's career is how drawn can he be? How overdrawn can he be? Can he carry the burden of this people? Um, yeah. Beautiful. That's just, that's just so beautiful. I love those parallels and the way that you're using uh, these words so beautifully. It, it adds, it adds, you know. You know, I think that when you're um, when you're kind of confronted by taking these ideas that we we were batting around back and forth, and you have to picture it, you have to create a visual for it. Um, it can go any which way, um, and I think that in in during our discussions, I had such a clear vision of the desert this 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 mountainous difficult terrain being something that was setting the scene it was there it was kind of like a drumbeat it, you know it's kind of like a musical uh undertone for 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 everything because of the hardship that they they were they were they were in and um so again, it, it's almost a little controversial to focus on something botanical in a desert when we know that the desert has so little botany, there's so little trees, there's so little plants that can survive in those conditions. But the, you know, there it was. And so um, I felt so confident that this was going to pu pull everything together. And it's so exciting to hear how um, it resonated with you and how you could, you could read into it um, so much. It's absolutely so satisfying. So thank you so much. Um, I know there's supposed to be some time here to talk about uh, process. I feel like Gabriella, your process is much more interesting than mine. <laughs> um, I know already people have asked like, how long did it take you to create this piece? Um, but I would love to hear any reflections on for you what the art, artistic process, the envisioning process was like for you. Right. So, um, right. So when I initially I sketched it out, I knew I wanted something very, very flat um, and very linear, long. Um, I just, I just feel like those years in the desert just were kind of endless in a way. They just dragged on and on day after day of being in this long desert and I wanted to underline that and so um, I love Google I downloaded those pictures of this the mountains of the Sinai and what did that look like and what it must have been like to have to prepare yourself for such a to, to go up into these mountains and um, 
that responsibility of having all these people's neshama, you know, all these, these souls kind of upon you. Um, I knew that I wanted Moses to be not a really old Moses, but a kind of a kind of younger than me Moses, you know, um, you know, somewhere in the 40s. Um, but again, careworn because there's a lot of pressure on him. There's a lot of responsibility on him. And a man that has directly had relationship with God must have, you know, it must somehow show on him, on him, on his physical body. Um, it's, it's also a very, um, I, I can imagine that, that having a relationship with God is something that really affects you physically. Um, and so um, again, doing this research into what kind of faces I wanted, what did Yitro, what could Yitro look like? What did Moses look like? So I did a lot of research about faces. I did a lot of research about the topography and, um, uh, and then finally putting it all together of, um, you know, and, and, and the, the five fellas that are, that are carrying the wood. Um, I wanted them to kind of also span a, a, a variety of physiognomies that it's, um, these aren't, you know, like from, uh, you know, Ashkenazi guys, you know, because <laughs> that's not what they were out, like out there in the desert. Um, so these are the kinds of things that I, that I put into it, um, the kind of thinking I did. I think, I think I did 10 or 11 sketches um, of both of them in order to really tweak it and get everything in place. And the process is, gosh, I wish I had a wood block to show. Um, the process is then I actually uh, am cutting it backwards. So because it's a, because printmaking is a reverse process, um, I use Sheena plywood, which is a Japanese plywood. Um, she, I use uh, Japanese cutting tools and um, non-toxic inks. Um, so I'm trying to be kind to the environment in my, even in my inking. And the papers are Japanese paper. It's Akawara paper. And um, it was all together. Rabbi, when did we start talking? Oh boy. I think it was Not that long ago. Beginning of November, something like Sounds that. Sounds about right. Sounds and about right. by um, it was done by um, it was done by beginning of December. So I mean I just pulled out all the stops. I was really putting a lot of time into it. I, I loved it. I loved the project, but I also felt like it, it had to be done. It had to be done right. Oh. Uh, maybe it would be a good time to, oh gosh, <laughs> to take some questions. I don't know if Devere, if yeah. you want to guide that. Yeah, let's, let's get into some, some of these questions that people have been asking throughout. Um, Daphna um, is, uh, was intrigued by uh, specifically the smoke and uh, if you would be able to explain kind of uh, some of this, the ideas behind the smoke, how it also kind of comes out of Moshe's shoulder and what, what its purpose is to serve. Is it uh, covering? Is it protective? Um, what, what were some of those thoughts about the smoke? Um, I, lo I love the imagery that um, there's always something kind of covering or, or leading the Jews. It was by day smoke and by night fire that they always felt that there was this place that they could look up and there, this, is, this is where we're heading or this is where we're at. And, I, I, and it was a kind of this unifying element and um, so I put the smoke kind of in front of the camp. So um, the people are kind of behind it. The, you can see the majority of the tents are kind of behind it because the smoke is almost kind of leading them. It's going to lead them to where, to their next, you know, to their next stop, to their next spot where they're, where they're going to be camping. Um, the smoke, um, I wanted it to be as, uh, symbolic looking as possible, that, it, that, that, that there was almost a solidity to it, that it's a pillar, right? It's a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke. And I love that imagery um, that there's, you know, of course, you know, smoke isn't 
isn't solid, right? The fire isn't solid, but but the, 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 these people relied on it as, as a compass in a way, and that this for them was what led them. You know, it was Moshe and these two elements, smoke and fire. I mean, I'll add to that, that you can see this narrative is in a sense surrounded by smoke. Immediately preceding this scene, of Yitro observing the system and advocating for a different uh, system of Torah teaching. Uh, immediately preceding this scene, Yitro offers a series of korbanot, a series of sacrifices in thanks and gratitude that he meets Moshe, that Moshe saved the people, etc. So the verses immediately preceding here, we have this smoke offering, and then the verses uh, following this moment uh, are, are that of the revelation in Sinai accompanied by a great smoke upon the mountain. And then also finalized there as well by ammo sacrifice and smoke. But I think we have the smoke of Sinai on the one hand and the smoke of Yitro meeting um, uh, Moshe on the other hand that sort of surround this scene textually. Yeah. Very beautiful. And also thinking about weightlessness of, of the smoke rising up and the unconsumable burning bush that we have below. There's a lot of uh, smoke and fire. Um, Richard McBee. Would you, uh, would you like to uh, come forth and ask your question? With pleasure, first pleasure. Well, um, Gabriella and, and, and um, uh, Rabbi, um, wow, this has just really been uh, eye-opening. Um, uh, I was never comfortable with the idea of Yisro, uh, even though the Torah says at first uh, that he comes first. It always seemed to make sense that, of course, he must be coming when Moshe Rabbeinu is, is judging in light of Torah. But you've turned it totally around now. And I suddenly see this as, um, as a kind of a double sandwich. The first sandwich is the thing that you, you sketched out having to do with the low tov, the low tov starting in Gan Eden, and this injunction that man can't be alone, human beings can't be alone, we need, we need help mates. Uh, and then the low tov here that uh, judgment and knowledge can't be alone. And uh, this before and after, seeing this essentially and, and basically understanding, let's be explicit about it, Sinai is in the middle. So then you ask the question, okay, but so what's he judging first? Well, he's judging because people have arguments and uh, it's not like they had no law, no sense of organization of a society, right? They certainly inherited something, but then they got Sinai. And so then the second uh, um, uh, woodcut is we have to do the after Sinai, we have to do this together. And then what's the next Parsha? Mishpatim. So that's, that's, what, your, that's what your second woodcut is about. It's about that we have to, and Mishpatim of all the ordinance of, in fact, of having adjudicating and having law that we need to do together. So you, you've kind of laid out really a, um, a stronger narrative of how the Torah is in these two images and also in your drasha. So I thank you. I thank you very much. It's really, it's op this has opened up this whole portion for me. Wowie, thank you. Maybe there's time for a couple more questions, comments. So also, um, Rabbi, could you, um, curious about that a lot of the conversation came forth because of this analysis of the phrase Navol Tibol. Yeah. And, and can you speak more to the other places that it arose, oh. some of the etymologies that, like, that you guys uh, both studied? Uh, sure. Um, uh, it's going to take a minute to uh, literally find the mad written, da written down in my, uh, my Trasha one moment. What I, I can say is offhand um, is once you start looking for the trees, uh, you'll start finding more. So as I highlighted in my words, um, Yitro offers to bring Eitzah. He'd like to give counsel, advice. I think, you know, that's the Hebrew term. It's also the Yiddish, Eitzah. Uh, but of course, that's directly parallel to the term in Hebrew for tree, Eitz. So if you start looking for an eights uh, in this text, you will in fact find an eights. And also in terms of the, the Gan Eden, um, eights dot tovara, the tree of knowledge, tree of knowledge of good and evil, um, throughout this text, Moshe and Yitro both use that root of dot and knowledge, 
Moshe is saying, look, I'm just trying to provide knowledge. I'm just trying to provide information to the people. Uh, and Yitro responding with Madua with a Dalit and Ayin also relates to Shoresh of Dat. Madua, for what reason, based on what knowledge would you uh, choose to do this? Um, so once you start looking for some of this terminology, you can really actually find it throughout, um, throughout this text. Um, as to the other places, I, I, look, it's not that uh, <laughs> it's not that exciting. If I could speak actually about my process a bit and how it relates to uh, those other references. So when you look at Navolti Bol, Rashi there, uh, Rashi's goal is solely just to understand what does this word mean? And, and towards, towards achieving that, he says, well, let's look at other places in Tanakh. And there are many Rashis like this, uh, where he'll take a word and analyze it by seeing other uh, moments where it occurs um, in Tanakh in the Bible. And this is one of those. And I'll be honest, I frequently skip those Rashis. Like, okay, Rashi, you've done the work. You've read through Yechezkel. You've read, you've read through Yemiyahu. I trust you. You got this. Um, with Gabriella, we dove into it. Um, and not only do we dive, dive into it and not just sort of trust Rashi, oh, it means wither. We saw why it means wither, wither uh, wither it means wither, um, but we, we looked at the, we noticed that the connotation is really striking and that the connotation is botanical and the connotation is tree rooted uh, in trees and in, and in uh, floral life. Um, and we, I'm in, in that regard, I'm very glad that we dove into those other examples and I, I can read uh, some of them uh, briefly over to you. Uh, yeah, so Yishayahu describes, uh, uses the phrase, like a withering leaf on the vine or shriveled fruit on a fig tree, like a withering leaf on a vine or a shriveled fruit on a fig tree. And that's the same Shoresh Nun Bet Lamed, Keen Vol or Uch Novelet, like a novelet, like a shriveled fruit. Uh, that's one example in Yirmiyahu, near the prophet describes certain leaves on a tree as Navel, as all withered. So these are Rashi's, these are comments that like, I frequently would just like skip over like, okay, that's what the word means, great. Uh, but with Gabriella and with an artist's eye, uh, the connotation obviously spoke so much to her. And thank God, it, I'm glad, very glad it did, because then I was able to see the whole chapter in a new light, uh, in, an, in a uh, botanical light, and ultimately in a Ghanaian light. Yeah. Gabriella, can you speak about um, some of your botanical work and... Uh... Uh, some those other uh, pieces that have kind of led you to this perspective? Yes, um, the botanical interest, my botanical, I mean, I'm a gardener. And so of course my, it all started with my garden, right? How, how perfect, it all starts in the garden. Um, and uh, my mom, my mom uh, uh, taught me the love of gardening and um, about, Eight years ago or so, I started a series about um, plants, herbal medicine uh, in folklore. And that was it. That was what really opened the door to how humans and plants interact and how important plants are in our lives. And I've done quite a few series of um, medicinal plants and humans. Um, and I did an entire series of trees, four tree, tree series that were kind of like the perfect Tu Bishvat series. Um, uh, so the four trees, um, there's the mother trees. There are trees that actually shelter younger trees in order to help them grow. There are the, there's the Shevet Achim trees. Trees like to grow together. They like the, the, the root systems are, are com uh, communicating to one another. They can signal um, danger to other trees. There's um, the dormancy is, is another one, which is kind of, um, you know, like uh, 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 when we, you know, when we go to sleep, like a tree also goes to sleep and um, the root system, the, the shorashim, you know, the, the, this entire beautiful system of roots of trees and how it all is, uh, becomes interconnected and how entire forests have these beautiful communication systems beneath our feet. I mean, these are, these are kind of things that it, the more I learn about 
botany, the more I learn about plant life, it's, it just is so intriguing. My next series, I'm just finishing up a series about uh, 18 stones in Judaism and how stones play such an important role. And as Rabbi mentioned, um, you know, it's not just the tablets, it's not just the stones we put on the graves, but, you know, Tzur Israel, I mean, the, the most important stone we have in, in Judaism. So I'm finishing up this series and um, I will be starting a series about fungus and how fungus affects humanity. And um, so these are, I, I'm always bouncing back and forth between, um, between these topics. Um, these are what interests me. And it's always a lot of research before I get there. And to be able to do it in Chivruta, wow, that's, that's my preferred methodology. And I just want to say, Dvir, I mean, your input was excellent. Um, you uh, added so many wonderful ideas and thoughts and it definitely, I incorporated that into my work. I wanted to point it out that you sit there and you're, you're kind of running the show, but you know what, you're, you're, you're taking this back seat. But as far as I'm concerned, um, the conversation where you came in with us was so wonderful. So thank you. Thank, thank you. This is, it's just, I think everyone got a real taste of how exciting the Torah in this, in this pairing was. Um, also, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Rabbi Greenfield about uh, kind of what brought you to this moment and, and uh, to give us a little expose of, of that experience for you. Sure. Um, so I'll just say I, uh, this is like, chapter three for me in a lifelong fascination with images in the Torah and the way that images can open up new understandings to the Torah. And I just, I'm much gratitude for Gabrielle for the first, first time in my life being able to be part of that process uh, instead of a passive participant. So I'll just say when I was in the undergrad at Yishu University, uh, I did a lot of research on the printed, the diagrams in the printed Torah, in the printed Talmuds and uh, diagrams and early Talmudic manuscripts. How did these little images get there? Why do we have pictures of sukkahs and picture, pictures of Erev, diagram, uh, Erev diagrams? Uh, and that was one of my like first sort of adult life research projects uh, in Torah in my pre-rabbinic days. Uh, and when I was in, later in college, uh, I was very lucky to get a fellowship to go out to Oxford uh, and look at Hebrew illuminated manuscripts um, with fascinating, beautiful illustrations of various scenes in the Torah in the 1300s and the 1400s and the 1200s. Uh, how were Jews at that time drawing and, their, and thereby commenting on the Torah? Uh, and what I loved in that process uh, in Oxford in the library um, was the ways that you know, all just like all it, translation is commentary, so to all drawing and artistry is commentary. And many times, interesting little midrashic details would show up, uh, transmitted not not mouth to mouth and not text to text, but drawing by drawing, which would perpetuate certain midrashic ideas or certain interpretive ideas. Um, I just I could I could imagine in one of these manuscripts in the 13th century finding some scene of Yitro and seeing a shrub in the background or a withering tree in the background. And I can imagine scholars saying, well, that's just part of the background artistry. Like that's just like a little scribble. That's just, you need to have a floor. You need to have uh, some plants in the background and then not realizing depths of the commentary. Uh, it would be so cool if we, if, if there is in fact some, some document like that from the 1200s, but I can say, I, and in this moment, I think it'll be very cool. 50 years from now, hundred years from now, 250 years from now, uh, folks are looking at, at Gabrielle's piece of art here, uh, seeing that that tree. And of course, my words will be lost and our words recorded here might be lost and it'll be left to them to figure, why, why is there a, a tree there in the corner? Um, and the, the Torah and the ideas that it alludes to. And of course, you give them a nice little hint with the burning bush and the second one, and maybe they'll start thinking about trees and the power of trees in this moment and the contrast between trees and stone. Um, so for me, this this... This is a nice closing to some of the threads that brought me into my rabbinate and some of the threads that brought me into deep uh, research and study of Torah. Um, I think it's soon time to go. Uh, I, I'm sure I'm sure there'll be other sort of closing words. I will try to say this in one minute, but uh, um, reflecting on, on Gabriella's um, medium, uh, I'm reminded of the passage in the Yushalmi and Shkalim that 
uh, God gave the Torah to us, to Moshe and thereby to us um, as black fire on white fire. Mm-hmm. Um, black fire on white fire. Uh, I think presumably what the Chazal, they, what the sages there are, are alluding to is the black fire is the letters. And obviously, yes, God gave us the letters of the Torah, uh, the black ink on, and the white fire is, is the, uh, the parchment. It's the paper, it's the background. And what's amazing about that claim that God gave us a Torah that's black fire on white fire is yes, black fire, we understand. The letters have meaning, the letters are eternal, the letters are fiery and powerful, but the claim is that the negative space the blank part of the parchment actually is fire too, and that we wouldn't fully appreciate and understand the letters. We didn't have the blank space there, the negative space there, the white space there either. That's the claim in the Yerushalmi, that the Torah isn't just black fire, it's black fire mixed with white fire, and together you can can appreciate and understand it. And I can think of no better uh, Talmudic statement uh, for for appreciating uh, woodcut than that. We have black fire and white fire, positive space and negative space, and seeing what you could do with basically just two colors with positive and negative next to each other uh, is really so powerful. And this, uh, this piece you created, created it, it, is, uh, it, it is the artistic representation. It's, it's black fire and white fire of art portraying the black fire and white fire of text. Uh, and I'm so grateful to have been part of it. Wow. wow. I always thought that the white fire was our interpretation of the black fire. Oh. <laughs> that's my, that's my I, take. I think the white fire is the parchment. The, the, the white fire is what we put into it. You know that that we give our we give our interpretations and our thinking into it, and that's what makes the black fire whole. Thank you, thank you. Though, though this uh, evening is coming to a close, there was no withering in uh, in the thought and in the. There wasn't just one speaker. <laughs> It was, it was magnificent to behold. And we were just so fortunate um, to, to have, have this presented today um, and this week, uh, the week of Tu Bishvat, the week uh, in, within the Shemitah, there's a lot of botany uh, coming, uh, emerging, blossoming forth. And thank you both for, for allowing us that opportunity. Um, uh, if anyone wants to hear this conversation, uh, uh, it'll be on the Facebook page. And the Dvar Torah that was so eloquently uh, presented today, you could also read the written transcript uh, on the Amen Institute website. And uh, thank you all really just for being here present today for a beautiful, flourishing evening. It's, it's really been uh, uh, a pleasure. Um, to hear your words. Also, um, we have uh, Robert Katz is here, who's uh, uh, Ben Greenfield's other yes. artist, Kavruta. Yes. So thank you for being here present. And thank you, everyone, really. Have a, a beautiful week. And uh, we have another on Sunday. So hope Excellent. you can all come to that too. Take care. Thanks. Bye.